I just have a way I usually do this. Hello, my name is Michelle Stofe. I'm the Research Communications Manager for Nemours Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children in Wilmington. And today we're going to talk about making a poster from an abstract. I put this talk together in response to a lot of questions that we receive in editorial services about how to make a poster once we've written the abstract, what do I need to put in it, and it also re represents a lot of the corrections we make to the posters that we see. So a lot of it will seem simple, but it's the things we do over and over again, and it represents um, the questions that we receive every year, especially during the poster season. Okay, what we're going to talk about, a quick overview with the general guidelines about posters, the different parts of a poster, including the MRAD, Intro, Methods, Results, and Discussion. So I'm talking mainly about scientific posters here. The text with some um, suggestions for font sizes and spacing, use of tables and figures, placement of your materials on, on your poster, how to get them on there and have them work right, use of color and photos, transport and travel of the poster file, e-posters, electronic posters, and some examples of posters that have errors that if we received it, we would make changes. Then we'll show you a corrected version, which will show you um, how much better it's going to look on, on the other end once you've taken some of our notes to heart. Okay, general guidelines. First of all, if you're going to go take a poster to a meeting, you're going to have meeting requirements. I point this out because a lot of times people don't notice this and they start to make the poster and it's much harder to redo what you've already worked on. A lot of times the meeting requirements include the poster number, contact information, and if they don't suggest you put it on there, I still suggest you add it. The layout, meaning does it have to be horizontal or vertical? If you're going overseas to Europe, more than likely it's going to be vertical instead of horizontal. But again, once you've made the poster in one layout, it's harder, it can be difficult to switch it to the other layout. So that's why we point this out. Um, supplies, <clears throat> what they're going to supply on the other end at the meeting itself, whether or not you need to travel with your mailing to, whether or not you need to bring push pins, placement of logos on the poster. Um, there are requirements about where our logo goes, and if you send a, a poster to us to print and proof, we're going to make sure it's in the right place. But use of logos of other institutions is also important. Use of templates. We do have templates that you can use for all different sizes, so you can check with us, or if you need a special template made, we can make it for you. Resolution of figures. Keep in mind, anything on a poster is going to be blown up to be larger. So don't automatically assume if it looks like okay on your screen that it's going to work on a poster. You have to look at your resolution, but we can give you suggestions what resolution that needs to be. It's usually 300 DPI or smaller. Sources for your logos, um, including uh, sources for figures as well, but sources for logos, whether we can provide it or where you're going to get them from the other institution. It's something you need to check with ahead of time. And then where your logos are going to go on the poster. The top left is considered the prime spot for logos, so that's where for all Nemours posters, the Nemours logo has to be. If you move it once you give it to us to print, uh, we're going to move it back. Okay, some general guidelines, um, a few more regarding sizes. The standard size they give you at a meeting is 48 inches by 96 inches, so about six by eight. You just can't be any bigger than that space, but you can be smaller. PowerPoint limitations for our templates and for slides is 36 by 56. So that's the largest template that we have, and it's also the largest that we can print. If you wanted to take a template and take it outside to print it larger, it is an option, but then it wouldn't be through our department. And again, the orientation, that's the landscape versus portrait. Uh, some meetings require one or the other, so you need to know that ahead of time or check into it. They usually send you an email when your poster is accepted, uh, and this information should be in there. And then other sizes. I mentioned that because there are some meetings, there are some um, organizations that have unusual sizing requirements. And if it's something that we will have a little difficulty printing, we need to know that ahead of time to make it work. Also, good segue into printing. We have different, there are different paper types, something to consider. We have glossy. We also have standard um, plain white paper for different departments, different groups. Some people prefer one or the other, but it's something to keep in mind. And printing services and costs. Right now, printing through our department is free for research posters, but that may change in the future. Um, so something to keep in mind. Also, if you're going to print outside of Nemours, there is a cost. And if you have Staples or Aztec print quickly for you, the cost is higher. So all these different um, details I'm giving you are things you need to look at early on in the process of doing your poster to make it easier on you. 
And the most frequently asked question I get with posters is how many slides make a poster? Well, it really depends on what's on your slides. I've done posters that are 15 slides or 20 slides. So once you start doing the layout of your poster, if you start putting it together and you're having to make your text too small, and I'll start giving you some points about that, that'll give you an idea whether or not you have too much. Anything you put on a poster, you can make fit. It's a, it's an, um, more an idea of whether or not it's going to be readable. Okay, parts of a poster. The title, keep it brief. Avoid things like discussion of or results of. Just say what you did or what you're going to do. And I suggest you make it interesting. Uh, this talk that I'm doing right now, I originally had it titled um, How to Make a Poster or Details About Making a Poster. So I changed it to I have the abstract. How do I make it into a poster? A little more interesting. Tells you a little more about what I'm talking about. Authors, I would suggest you always include your credentials, even if the meeting says not, don't get, even if the meeting does not give that requirement, because it's good for readers to know if it's a nurse, if it's a physician, if it's a psychologist, who the authors are. Same with institutions. If they don't suggest you give the institutions, I'd always give the institutions as well as city and state, even though we think Nemours is well known everywhere, and they all know that we're in Wilmington, Delaware, or in Orlando, Florida. Not everybody does, so I would say always include that after your institution. And size for your title. People like to make little tiny titles. Don't be stingy. Our suggestion is 70 point um, minimum, 60 to 50 point for authors and institutions. If you have more room, make things bigger. It's the first thing they're going to see on your poster. You want people to come read it, so you don't want them fighting to, to read your title. Okay. Your abstract, the part of your poster, the abstract. This is the first thing. It's usually in the top left. It's the first thing people are going to read. A lot of times they'll read that, and from that they decide if they want to look at the rest of your poster. It should match what you submitted when it was accepted. You are allowed to correct errors. A lot of people ask that. So if there's a typo in the one you submitted, you are allowed to change that for your poster. Structured or unstructured, I include that only because um, abstracts sometimes had it have headings, sometimes they don't. You're going to go by what the meaning was. Um, if they don't need headings, don't put them in. It's going to save you space. Your abstract should be able to stand alone. So if you use abbreviations in your abstract and you need to keep them as abbreviations, you're going to spell them out at first use. You're going to do the same thing when you start the intro or the rest of the body of your poster. And your abstract can be a little smaller font. If you start to get to sizing, that's one of the sections you can bring down a few points. Okay, the rest of the poster, the introduction and methods. Your introduction is what's already known on your subject and you're going to lead into what's missing and your project is going to tell them how it fills that gap. Again, abbreviations, spell out first use in your intro. Consider your audience. If it's a nursing poster um, and you're going to a general nursing meeting and you're using a lot of intensive care or, or PICU abbreviations, maybe you want to spell them out. If you're going to a critical care meeting, maybe you don't need to spell them out. So on a poster, you're a little more, um, it's a little more open whether or not you need to spell out your abbreviations. When in doubt, spell out everything. Your methods are what you did or what you plan to do. And for posters and for manuscripts, if an IRB statement is required, that's going to be your very first line of your methods. So that's what we suggest to put it, that first bullet point. Your results and discussion. The results are your findings. This is where your figures and tables are going to go, and I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. This will be where you report your data. Be careful not to report your data in both places, in your figures and in your text. Your text should refer to your figures, but you don't need to state the same information. And then your discussion and conclusion. That's basically why your study or project is important. And that would also include your future plans, if any. Okay, your references of a poster. References do belong on a poster if you use them. A lot of people ask. The simplest format, formatting is the best. And I give an example on this slide, short and sweet. Consider clarity when citing in the text. Some people like to use the name and date on posters. Again, Clarity, sizing, spacing, all that comes into play when you're working on a poster. So usually numbers in parentheses is the best format. Um, superscript can be a little hard to read once it's large. Your references section can definitely be a smaller font. And if you are listing them at the end, make sure you cite them in the text. A lot of people like to list a list, uh, put a list of references at the end, but not put them in the text, but then it's more of a suggested reading list. And at best, it's going to look like you just forgot to put them in. So if you have a list, we want to see it somewhere in the text. And if we review your poster for you, we're going to point that out. Okay. Text in general. The size of your text of a poster should be seen from at least six feet away. So our suggestion is 30 point Helvetica or Arial or some type of sans serif font. No lower than 24 to 26 point. Anything smaller than that will be hard to read. 
and avoid Times Roman or any kind of font that has a serif. Limit justification because at that size, um, when you blow something up and it's justified, you're going to see rivers of white space amongst the text and it just doesn't look right. Same with indentations. Um, in indenting paragraphs, we limit. It looks better pretty much block saw, but not with the justification. Bullets are better than paragraphs of text and keep those bullets consistent. Don't use different bullets for different parts of the paper. Title spacing and font size. Pretty much your heading should be bigger than the text below it. And the spacing above a title should be more than below it. Those are the two points. The overall best layout for a poster, if you can, is about equal parts text and figures. So when you get a general idea and you look at it, if it looks like that, that's a good attractive format. And open space is our friend. You don't need to spill it, fill up every inch of your poster slide. White space is okay. It's okay if your third column does not go all the way to the bottom. And remember, you are competing with a lot of other posters in the hall and you want people to come over and make it easy for them to read, attractive, so then you're gonna be standing by your poster. You can fill in remaining uh, details that you haven't been able to put on there. So the main idea is that you're able to attract your reader to cl for collaboration, to encourage funding. So we want the poster to be attractive, brief, and easy to read. Okay, your figures and tables, how many? A lot of people ask. Well, when you start looking at your numbers, make sure, or we suggest, um, avoid making anything smaller than five by seven when it's printed. You're gonna cite them all in text. So if you have a figure somewhere on the poster, make sure there's a sentence somewhere that says figure two, figure one. For color, just keep the consistent to the same two to four colors or in the same color family. So you don't want one figure to be pastel, another one to be primary colors, another one to be black and white, another one to be neon. Keep them in the same family. They don't have to go with the defaults in PowerPoint. There's lots of options. If you don't know what colors to use, um, a good choice would be colors that are already found in our logo, the red and the blue. Or if you have any photos on your poster, pull colors off of that. It'll look like you matched everything on purpose and actually gives you a nice cohesive look. Keep your, your figures and your tables and your, and your um, items on your poster simple. So you don't need a lot of shading or 3D when you're doing posters. Again, the idea is they get the information quickly, uh, as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. And format. Um, we mentioned that because a lot of people have issues bringing uh, photos or bringing figures over into the poster. When you copy a chart over, it comes over with a box. Take the box off. Um, and check the consistent sizing of charts. Just because you're taking it from PowerPoint and putting it onto your poster, don't assume it's all gonna be the same size. Uh, a, little, a few more things about figures and tables. Legend and titles. All figures have legends at the bottom, all tables have titles at the top. For your tables, you're gonna limit your rules, especially vertical rules. No vertical rules if you can avoid it, otherwise it'll look like a big grid. Again, you're blowing things up larger so it does look different than it does on, on a page, an eight and, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Your figures and tables, a lot of times somebody reading your poster might look at the figures first. And so your figures and tables should be understandable without having to go hunt down in the text what they mean. So if there's an abbreviation on the table that might need spelling out, put that in the legend. And inserting your figures and tables into the poster. We found the easiest way, especially with tables, is copy your figure first without all the text elements, without some of your labels. Copy and paste special, so it comes over as a snapshot. Then if you have three figures, um, add your labels or add the titles at the end for all three figures at that stage so they all be the same size. Photos. HIPAA and permissions. Um, obviously, if you have any patient photos, you need a permission statement that exactly, that specifically states it's okay to use their figure or use their photo on a poster. Don't assume a general uh, consent form will work for everything on a poster. We always make sure they have the patient family know this is what it's going to be used for. Uh, masking of photos if you need to use a photo and um, just like with manuscripts there are ways to mask it by covering up the eyes for doing other things to it but we try not to do that if we don't need to because it's not really attractive but it's it can be done. Use of photos and figures from the internet. Uh, don't assume because it's on the internet one that it's going to print okay or blow up okay or that you can use it. I've had people say I pulled this off it was a there was a photo of, it was a depression paper about depression. They pulled a picture of a child, of a, of a sad child off the internet and wanted to use it. We weren't able to because you don't know what the original purpose of that photo was. Just because it's on the internet does not mean it's available. Uh, <clears throat> so there are different places you can get photos from. PR is a very good source of stock photos. Um, if you need a sad child photo, they can find you one and it's okay to use and there's no issues with permission. 
Uh, for sizing for posters, again, 300 DPI, you don't need anything higher than that resolution. Anything lower than that might not blow up okay. But Cindy Broadway and photography can also help you if you have something. You, she knows it's for a poster, she can make it workable. And if you don't have any figures on your poster, whether it's a chart or a photo, find one. Add one or add some. It makes a big difference in the readability, takes up the space, and it's much more attractive to read. Okay, transport and other details. Once you've made your poster, how do you get it to the meeting? Um, going through our department, we will give you a mailing tube. We'll also give you push pins. Um, sometimes you can take them through security or you can't, flying, but something to keep in mind. Some people do FedEx or mail their poster ahead of time. The only thing with that is send it ahead, include your arrival date, and confirm that it has been um, received because we have had ones that not show up on the other end. The concierge should hold it for you, but make sure you check that before you leave. Also take it with you on, on a flash stick or something just in case. Uh, security when traveling is the fact that if you it will be considered a carry-on. You may need to open it when it goes through the scanner. And again, the push pins that, um, may or may not make it through the security, so you might need to check those. Returning after your meeting, uh, we keep the file. You'll have the file if it needs to be printed later. We have people who mail it back, who bring it back. Um, all of them are fine, but we will keep the file and you'll have the file if needed later. And handouts. A lot of people ask, how can I have a handout of my poster? If you're using one of our templates, you can print it out on a regular printer. Just use scale to fit and it'll print out an 8.5 by 11 sheet. Okay. Electronic posters. This is something new. More and more meetings are doing these. Works the same way, same tips and tips and suggestions. It's usually a dark background with white text instead of a white background and, and dark text. There's no longer a size requirement, but there's a ratio requirement. It's the same as an HDTV screen, 16 by 9, because these are usually displayed on HDTVs in a hall somewhere. The other difference is they're uploaded ahead of the meeting. So unlike a printed poster you need to take with you the day before the meeting, the e-posters usually are due a week or two or more before the meeting date. And we do have templates for e-posters as well if you need one. Okay, some examples. This is what we call the error enhanced poster. This is typical of what we would receive sometimes. People would send us that they've done a poster. And there's a lot of things. We have figures that are different colors. We have a few different kinds of fonts. Some things are centered, some things are left justified. We have several kinds of um, bullets. The logos have a few issues in them. So, th so this is a suggestion um, how not <laughs> to put things together. Um, it's a good start. The title needs some changes. So what we did is I took, and this isn't really a real one, it is error enhanced, I added some things to it. And so the second example is what we've done to it to make it a little more readable. Um, for example, the title now, the whole thing now is actually in Arial, so it's much more readable, this type font. We've made the bullets the same. We've used the same color scheme for our figures. Uh, the spacing above, above and below the titles is consistent. There's more space above a title than below. Uh, we've gotten rid of justification. It's now um, just, less, just left justified. Uh, nothing is centered. Um, it's just more readable. It's basically the same information. Um, and I, we pulled the colors as well from our logos. So everything kind of matches. And again, this is an example when we get a poster someone has worked on, these are the things we do to posters over and over again. And when people look and say it looks so much better, we've just done these simple steps and it just cleans it up. Okay, in summary. So your layout, text, and figures, keep everything simple. Use color. If you don't have anything, find something with color. Use plenty of open space. White space is not a bad thing on a poster. It will not look like you don't have enough information. And you are standing next to it if you need to fill in some gaps. You can. About half text and half figures is a really great um, layout to shoot for. If I was doing a poster, that's what I would go for. And overall, you want to present an easy to read and attractive presentation, again, to have people come read your poster, to encourage collaboration and funding, and again, most importantly, to present, present the results at the meeting that you're attending. Uh, my information, I'm the Research Communications Manager and Editorial Services in Wilmington. There's my contact information. Email me or give me a call if you have any questions. Thank you.